Tum, 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 tum. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to Saratoga Springs Planning Commission meeting. Today is Thursday, July 13th, 2017. Um, we are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Kimber, who is not going to be with us very long, would you lead us in this Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Let's have a roll call. I'll start with Commissioner Steele. Troy Cunningham. Kirk Wilkins. Ken Kilwar. Brian Chapman. Hayden Williamson. We have a quorum city staff. Brian Miller, city attorney. Ron again, staff engineer. Sarah Carroll. Marie Gabrizek. Dave Stroud. All right, thank you very much. This is a public meeting. If there are any of you who are in the audience who would like to come up and discuss anything that's not on the agenda, we invite you to come forward at this time. We'll open up public comment. If there isn't any public comment, we'll close public comment at this time and we'll move on to item number four. Uh, this is a public hearing. It's an administrative recommendation for a site plan and conditional use permit for AT&T cell tower located approximately 400 West Crossroads Boulevard. Justin Hadley is the applicant. I will turn the time over to Sarah Carroll for the presentation. Okay. The, the subject property is just to the west of the IHC property. The city owns a 0.34 parcel, acre parcel uh, with a pump house on it. And it, right adjacent to it is a Questar gas substation, I believe. And right on that piece the applicant would like to install a 100 foot cell tower and a utility structure they would need a lease agreement with the city and then it's also come to our, our attention that they would need an access easement from ihc to access their site so here's the site plan uh, here's a close-up of the the floor plan views and then here's the tower and the proposed utility structure. In the staff report, there, the colored renderings weren't available when that went out. They have since provided photos of similar structures. There's a recommendation that they match the city's structure that's on the site. So the, uh, the one with the pitched roof is what you're seeing for the city's pump house. And we're asking that they match that. Uh, so that's a little bit nicer of a structure. And then in the staff report, uh, there's mention of chain link fencing in in the code it's not currently allowed there's some proposed amendments later on the agenda related to utility sites those there's a recommendation to allow chain link for utility sites however even with that recommendation staff still recommends that we require a wrought iron style aluminum fence this has been discussed with the applicant and they don't have concerns with that and we've also discussed the change to the elevations with them and they're not concerned with that uh, there is one additional condition that you see here that they, as I mentioned, they need to enter into a lease agreement. We want to make that a condition that they do that prior to issuance of a building permit and prior to commencing construction. And then one other condition would be related to the easement that they acquire an access easement from IHC. There's a small strip of property between the right of way and the parcel owned by the city that's owned by IHC and their access um, is these two dashed lines that you're seeing kind of in the middle of this diagram uh, and that would require an easement. So we're recommending that that be added as a condition as well. It's yeah. It's right in the it's right in the middle. Oh. Right. It's public right of way. So the strip of land right there is IHC property. Thank you very much for the presentation. Is the applicant here? 
Hi there. Could you um, state your name and address for the record, please? reason that we're here tonight is because all of us love cell phones. Now, as for informational purposes, just wanted to give you a little background on this tower. Right now, Saratoga Springs is, is covered by, by cell signal, meaning with the towers that are around, you will see bars on your phone, at least if you're a Verizon, I'm sorry, an AT&T subscriber. What this site will do is, is help with the data capacity that is needed for the area. Uh, there's projections by the year 2020 that um, data consumption will increase by seven times what it is right now. It's just crazy how much how much data that we're using. So the purpose of this site is to help in, help help handle all of that extra data and capacity that that's needed in this area. So generally, the carriers will kind of target uh, a populated or where there's a lot of called a hot spot where there's a lot of data being used in the area and so right there in that area where you know there's Walmart and all the other businesses that are around is, is really consuming a lot of data so the purpose of this site is to help with that um, as far as the conditions as, as as she stated there you know we're, we're fine with those the one that was brought up um, I don't know that it was addressed just now but that the tower be painted black which again we're happy to do but just wanted to point out that We've, I've never, I've done a lot of cell sites. I've never seen a black tower before. I, you know, personal opinion is that it might stand out a little, little more than, than a gray or silver tower that, you know, kind of matches other power lines, power towers in the area. But we're happy to paint it any color you want. As far as the fencing goes, we can do whatever kind of fencing, um, the elevations for the building. Uh, so whatever, whatever you'd like to see. But, um, you know, if there's any other questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, all right, thank you. You can join us right here if you'd like. Go ahead and have right a seat. Okay. You can turn on the microphone and we'll probably have questions for you later. Absolutely. But now, uh, since this is a public meeting, we will open up public comment for item number four for the AT&T cell tower. If anybody has any comments about that, we invite you to come forward at this time. Okay, given that we don't have any, we will close public comment. Are you deliberating in the back there? Hi there. Nice. Could you um, state your name and address yes, for the record? Um, my name is Ken Evans. Ken. Um, I am adjacent property owner to the proposed cell tower site. Um, I would request that before um, I make my comments, and I don't know if there's very many people here because no one really knows about this public hearing, um, that you read the uh, letter that was sent to the chairman. Uh, we were just discussing that. We, we have it here and we will read it in. Uh, I'd be happy to go after that letter is read. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, this is part of the public comment, but we, I think it would probably be important to read this first. So would you go ahead and read that in? We had a letter that was sent to me personally. I forwarded it on to Kimber and to the rest of the commission, but it's, it's, it needs to be a matter of public record. So this is an email and it starts out, good afternoon, Kirk. In your position as chairman of the Saratoga Springs Planning Commission, I'm reaching out to you to provide you some feedback and comment relative to the attached Saratoga Springs Planning Commission public hearing notice for Saratoga Springs conditional use application, which if approved, would allow Saratoga Pr Springs City construct or allow a third party through contractual agreement with Saratoga Springs City to construct a 100 foot tall cell tower facility on city owned property. <coughs> I will not be able to attend the public hearing tomorrow evening as I have a prior commitment. I cannot change, but wanted to provide you feedback from Intermountain Healthcare since the cell tower facility will be directly adjacent to property and facilities owned by Intermountain Healthcare, which feedback and comment we respectively request be entered into the public record as public comment. I will try and be as objective as I can with my following comments. My thoughts and comments are as follows. Cell towers are almost always developed with only function in mind, so utility and not aesthetics are the driving force in their consideration. Said another way, they are most l often less than attractive. Further, a 100-foot cell tower will stand out regardless of 
your vantage point within a reasonable distance from the cell tower. From a residential standpoint, having this type of cell tower facility directly adjacent to a home or residential development certainly does not add value to your property. There have been empirical studies that suggest some diminution of value occurs relative to residential property when it is in close proximity to cell tower facilities of the magnitude plan for this site. From a commercial office medical services standpoint, having this type of cell tower facility directly adjacent to the type of developed property as long as it does not impede visibly and or access to the developed property does not seem to detract from the value of adjacent developed property as long as the tower does not directly block visibility to the property or its improvements. The key element here is how the tower is cited in relation to the type of commercial office medical services property. If the tower were to be cited directly in front of a commercial office medical services, it could very well diminish the value of the commercial office medical services. While placing the cell tower adjacent to but somewhat removed would probably not have the same detrimental effect on the commercial office medical services property. In the specific cases of the Intermountain Healthcare Saratoga Springs Clinic, the proposed cell tower, while being quite visible by anyone coming to the public, will not directly impede visibility and or access to the clinic. Further, you could make the argument that the cell tower could end up being a landmark for the clinic. Just look for the large cell tower, and our clinic is directly adjacent and east of the tower. I don't know if there's any empirical evidence from a medical standpoint that would suggest adjacent to a cell tower facility is a threat to human health and safety. The irony, the irony with this application is Saratoga Springs City was a very strict signage statutes and in several areas of the city would not allow this tower installation. However, the land owned by the city is zoned regional commercial, same zoning classification as the Undermount Clinic property and public and private utilities facilities are a conditional use within the zoning classification. Hence, the conditional use application submitted by the city for city approval of the cell t t tower, it says town installation. I think they meant tower. Clearly, Saratoga Springs is making this application since they will directly benefit from the financial arrangement they have entered into with AT&T subject to this conditional use approval. The cell tower will not be attract will not be an attractive landmark or an approved facility, but in this day and age, cell phone usage and coverage is an ever-increasing necessity, all things being equal. It would be more appealing if the tower were placed in a location that did not provide the direct adjacency to residential and commercial office medical services development this cell tower or facility will produce. However, given this, given the above, from a reasonable standpoint, Intermountain Healthcare cannot in good faith ask that the conditional use application be denied. One last comment. While I realize city staff is very busy, but since the cell tower will be placed on city-owned property, it would, be, it would have been a magnanimous gesture on the part of Saratoga Spring itself to have reached out directly to the affected property owners, which in this case I believe were only three owners to discuss the proposed cell tower facility in an effort to engage good, well dialogue. Intermountain Healthcare would have appreciated and applauded the good faith gesture immensely. If you have any questions, it, or of me, please feel free to send me an email or call me phone number below. Thank you for your consideration of our thoughts and comments. Respectfully submitted, Tom, I'm going to have to spell his last name, U-R-I-O-N-A, Corporate Real Estate Director, Intermountain Healthcare, 36 South State Street, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84111. Thank you, Tom. And we'll invite Kevin Ken to come back up if you'd like to. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, my name is Ken Evans. I live on the property adjacent to uh, the proposed cell tower. Um, I'll try and make my comments concise and succinct. I've written them down to do that so that I don't, uh, as I'm getting older, I can wander in my conversation. Um, years ago, Questar Gas threatened eminent domain and forced me to sell a small land parcel along what is now Crossroads Boulevard, adjacent to the proposed cell tower site to build a natural gas substation. In my negotiations with them, they allowed my input on the design, agreeing that aesthetic considerations were important, and since it was, especially since it was next to the entrance to my property, which I plan to develop in the future. Of the three owners, uh, I represent two of them, uh, my family partnership and uh, me personally as landowners. Um, 
so the city didn't have to spend too much money on postage to notify adjacent property owners. A few years ago, the city approached me, Saratoga Springs City approached me about selling them a small land parcel adjacent to the Questar structure, which they badly needed for a water reduction station. I didn't want to sell, concerned about the aesthetics of the property that I own and plan to develop along SR 73, now Crossroads Boulevard. But I agreed to when city officials I dealt with address my concerns about the image, size, and height of their structure and assured me it would be consistent with the community image of the area and my future development plans, which I shared with them and they were aware of. They also assured me that anything built on the remainder of the small site would be given the same aesthetic considerations. With the city's strict signage and development codes and the verbal commitment I was given, I never dreamed that we would be here discussing a proposal to build a cell tower there. A 100-foot cell tower will stand out as an eyesore regardless of your vantage point within a reasonable distance from the tower. Even those designed to look like trees look out of place and are unattractive. They adversely affect the character, aesthetics, and desired community image of residential and commercial developments. I've submitted concept plans to the city to develop my 20-acre property into three phases. A large lot subdivision in the north, a custom home 55 plus community in the center transition area, and commercial along Crossroads Boulevard. I've waited until the 400 West Road dedication was finalized in which IHC and I donated land to the city to build the road before proceeding further with my development plans. While not approved, everyone in planning, engineering, legal, and on the planning commission should be aware of my engineering and development plans since they were referred to repeatedly during the 400 West Road negotiations over the last two years. And I also presented them to these plans to the city council during this process. This cell tower, if constructed at this proposed site, will have a negative impact on my ability to proceed with my development plans. Numerous national studies report that property values decline near cell towers and that they negatively affect the character and aesthetics of both residential neighborhoods and commercial developments. A drop in property values of 20% in communities around the country isn't uncommon. In a survey by the National Institute of Science, Law, and Public Policy, 94% of the respondents reported that the presence of a cell tower would impact interest in a property and the price they would be willing to pay for it. And 79% said under no circumstances would they ever purchase or rent a property within a few blocks of a cell tower. Why is that? Some fear that RF radiation from cell phones and cell towers has an ad adverse effect on health. If I truly believed that, I wouldn't carry a cell phone around with me all the time, and I'm sure that there are as many empirical studies questioning whether that fact is true as there are uh, controversial studies that suggest that there, there is an impact. Um, I don't know. Um, to counter that is an impediment, however, which it was becoming a serious one in communities across the nation for, for cell for wireless companies. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 did something amazing. It stripped all states and local governments from their power to consider the potential adverse health effects of RF radiation from cell towers when a wireless company files an application to install one. And then in 2009, the FCC set up a shot clock, uh, not part of basketball. A shot clock is a new weapon for wireless companies. If applications for new towers aren't decided within 150 days by commissions and city councils like you, wireless companies can sue them in court. I guess it's amazing what a few hundred million dollars of uh, political contributions and lobbying can buy. Cell towers also pose some hazards. The most common, although not frequent, but they happen, are tower fires, collapse, and explosion. One such incident occurred last September when a cell tower caught fire and collapsed on the Bangator Highway, closing traffic in both directions. The proposed cell tower, this proposed cell tower, uses a diesel generator located in the base, and its base is a backup power system. 
in the event of a fire or explosion being located next to Questar's propane substation and the city's water station, I assume could be problematic. This conditional use permit is being submitted by the city to the city for city approval and appears to be made so that the city can directly benefit financially from lease, a uh, lease arrangement, financial arrangement with AT&T. If I, as an adjacent property owner, were to submit a similar application for a cell tower in this high profile location, to be located just a few yards from this proposed location, if it were proposed on my property, my application would undoubtedly be denied for the reasons I've just outlined and many more. Um, this is the wrong location for a cell tower. We need them. Nobody questions that. Um, using Walmart as an example doesn't seem quite appropriate since there's a cell tower right behind Walmart. I have a couple of questions. Has planning explored other locations? Is there capacity in the cell tower that was just mentioned behind Walmart? Why is uh, Mr. Uriana uh, suggested what wasn't, weren't property owners notified in advance when my plans clearly were known and available and the city has worked closely with IHC on a number of issues. Um, their, <laughs> their response was obviously a lot more politically correct uh, than mine. Um, there are reasons communities all around the country are objecting to, and in many cases, stopping cell towers from being built near residential and retail commercial developments. This is a high profile, major road in the city that I have gone to great lengths to try and protect the aesthetic integrity of, and the city and previous planning or planning commission members and city council members have been equally as concerned. Um, at a minimum, I request that there be additional time given to the to to me and IHC um, as adjacent property owners to address these issues to actually have the opportunity to get some of the neighborhoods that are going to be visually impaired by this. And I guess maybe I could speak on behalf of the uh, dozens and dozens of families that I suspect would be here if my proposed development have had been built. Um, this is this this is this is more than I don't want this in my backyard. Nobody wants it in their backyard. Uh, and I would hope that the commitment that the city made, city officials made to me at one point in time has some bearing and some weight uh, and that the actions and the good faith that I exhibited and was reciprocated by city plan planning and city officials in the two projects that are, or the project that is on the property that I sold to the city on my Crossroads Boulevard frontage, um, which I didn't make very much money on. Uh, I, I hope that there would be some consideration to keeping that that commitment. This is the wrong place for something that may be badly needed, but there's got to be better alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Is there any other? Are there any other comments? Hi, my name is Aaron Delahunty. Um, I uh, didn't know about this meeting until I got a text message from my, my, my backdoor neighbors, my backyard neighbors here. Aaron, could you, for the record, could you give us your address? Oh, uh, yes, 443 West Aspen Hills Boulevard. Thank you. I think you're familiar with that road. <laughs> um, so while I'm not an, an adjacent property owner, I do sit on my back porch every night and enjoy the view that I have as I have uh, improved that land and, uh, and, and, and do enjoy that view. Now, my backyard view will be in 
direct line sight of this 100 foot structure. Um, I don't know how many of you would, would enjoy having a structure like that uh, or in your backyard view, um, if, if you do have one, but uh, not, not something that me or my family would, would, would uh, enjoy or appreciate. Um, again, I realize as I am not a direct property owner, I am a direct view uh, property owner of, of that view in the back, and it's fantastic. And I would like to see that protected. Um, I've not seen any alternate options provided. Um, a lot of the a lot of the information I just learned tonight, I, you know, from uh, from Brother uh, uh, Mr. Evans. Uh, um, you know, if this is the the city proposing this location, I would ask that you please, um, you know. Remember the agreements that you made with with uh, Mr. Evans, and protect that area for not only us that that have a, a great view of Saratoga Springs, which is beautiful. I enjoy living here, uh, but but also for those future property owners that will be uh, there one day when his property is developed. So that's about all I have to say here tonight. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Delahunty. Any other comments from the public for item number four? Okay, given that there aren't, we will close public input at this time, and we will go ahead and try to answer some of the questions that have been presented before us. Um, should we turn that over to our applicants first, see if you would like to address some of the concerns that have been brought up? Bet. So in, in, for, as far as location goes, we, we did look all over quite a bit we spent a couple months looking for a decent location we did pick the city property um, primarily because we thought that the city would enjoy the income from it um, and it looked like a good a good space grant with the uh, the questar facility that was there on site and didn't really see anything else that could be used for it so that was one of the factors in our consideration you know we, we had had no no idea what was being developed around it just a bunch of empty land but it, as far as the there is a cell site just behind walmart um, at a public storage facility the problem with that site and and we did look at that site primarily to see if we could use it and, and the fact is that it is just too too short and um, if we were if at&t were to put antennas on that it would probably be at about a 20 foot level and if, that, if we were to do that, we would just have to put more and more towers around to be able to get the coverage. We, we need the height in, in order to minimize the amount of towers that, that are in the area. So that, that's primarily the reason why we chose this location. Um, as well as it's agricultural, which allowed for uh, Walmart is an IHC letter. I think you referenced they're the same, but it's off from Sarah's agricultural. Well, we will clearly admit that you know cell towers are, are not the most attractive, you know, visibly. I don't think that any tower is, but it, you know, it, it really just comes down to the necessity that it that it's needed. Um, we're happy to entertain. You know, we we looked at looked at a tree possibility, but you know, in looking at the area, there's just no other trees around. So we thought that you know a silver tower would eventually just kind of blend in and be forgotten. Um, clearly, they're not by Mr. Evans, uh, and I can understand that. But you know, it's. They, they tend to disappear with time is as far as uh, as far as property values go that that is one concern that we get all the time um, and you know of course the carriers do their side of uh, look at the the research on their side and and have found that the majority of home buyers uh, these days tend to that usually is one of the two top criteria for purchasing a home is to be able to have good sale coverage and so they you know what we found is that they don't typically shy away from cell towers, they gravitate towards them so that they can get they can get good cell coverage. Yeah, let's, let's go through a couple other the concerns that we had. Um, you did say that you explored other locations. There was a question about behind Walmart. Yeah, there there is an existing cell tower behind Walmart. Okay, and this would have some kind of Interference no, the and the reason being is that it's too small. It's not. It's not tall enough. Okay. On your height limit, is either 35 or 40 feet. We would be limited to about 20 feet on it. 
Chair, can we get the city to address um, the, the one concern of Mr. Evans is that spoke the loudest to me was the fact that he sold the city property and there was a yeah. verbal handshake agreement on uh, what would be done with that property and this would clearly constitute a, a direct violation of that agreement. So I'm hoping someone in the city can uh, shed some insight on that. Sure. We were gonna, I was going to turn it over to the city as soon as we made sure that any of the other concerns have been addressed and then we'll turn it over to them. Um, let's see. About the evidence that was presented that there's a potential 20% decrease in property value, 79% in decreased favorability about living a few blocks away from a cell tower. Did you want to respond to any of that? Well, yeah, I, I think I did briefly, and I'm, I'm not sure where that information is coming from. You know, we can we can provide articles that the cell carriers, of course, have, have found um, to kind of contradict that, indicating that a lot of new home buyers are looking for locations that have good cell signal. Okay. All right, let's turn it over to the city to respond to any other questions, and I have a couple of them listed, but I'm sure you're taking notes too. So just a, a little bit of history on it, um, some which I was not aware of apparently with the uh, uh, handshake agreement. So when this, when this proposal came forward, uh, the applicants actually approached the city about placing a, a cell tower on city property. Um, at the time, the, the you know, staff, we had no idea what the city council wanted to do with city owned property and if it was even, uh, backing up even further, some cities require cell towers to be located on city property. Um, other cities make it um, the first choice and you have to demonstrate to the city why it's not feasible to go on city property and other cities have no policy. And so our city has no policy as to where we require or prefer cell towers to be located. Uh, so the applicants met with staff looked over the project, we said, look, you can't turn in an application unless the city signs the application because the landowner has to give authority. And we don't know what the city council policy is, so hold off. <coughs> and so uh, Owen Jackson and planning, we put together some information from other cities as to what those policies are. Also provided the council with information on what the code was for that zone. Um, and the height limits and so on. And also we asked the applicants for information on why a 100 foot pole, why not a 70 foot pole? And you know, as they mentioned, the taller the pole, the fewer poles they need. So the city has the choice between higher poles and fewer or shorter poles and more of them. And so that was something that was discussed with the council. Uh, the council um, went, th went through the various options, um, discussed whether towers were appropriate in city parks, on uh, utility sites, uh, on locations like this and eventually came to the consensus that we need to have a formal policy but in the meantime this property is zoned agriculture it allows for the use it's something that can go forward and uh, if if the adjacent property owner applied for it it's an administrative approval and would go forward anyway so why not place it on city property so it is an administrative decision but can you touch on the conditional use permit Yes. And what the decision is before the Planning Commission today. Yes, so it's an administrative decision, uh, but it is a conditional use permit, which means it's an allowed use with conditions. Uh, there are certain limitations in addition to the standard limitations that are put in place through that conditional use permit process. Uh, there are different height limits for different zones. There's a requirement that they show that they cannot co-locate on a nearby pole if there is one. In this case, A, there is no very nearby pole, and B, there, the nearest poles are not of the size and capacity and height necessary to meet their needs. So they, they, they complied with those requirements in the conditional use permit. The conditional use permit also requires that the, the pole be designed with stealth if there's something there to stealthify it. You know, if it's going on in a forest or in a park, make it look like a tree. If it's going up against a utility uh, structure, make it look like the utility structure. Uh, do what they can to make it, you know, to stealth the, to shield it and camouflage it. In this case, there was nothing nearby. Uh, staff is encouraging them to use, you know, less shiny and bright finishes uh, to help minimize the, the visibility, but that was, that was the extent of that criteria. So you can look at the impacts of it through the conditional use permit, but it is still an administrative decision. If they meet all those criteria, then that's, that's the direction. 
Mm. Uh, but the city did not approach the, the applicants and does not have a policy requiring these to be located on city property. The applicants approached the city. Okay, and for the, the people who are here, an administrative decision that is presented before the Planning Commission, we are instructed and, and we are held to making that decision based upon the code that is currently in the city and the, um, the state law. So we are unable to make a decision based upon things that are, that are evidentiary or hearsay or feeling. We are, we are not able to make a decision based upon that, but based only on the code and the law. Uh, so turn this over. they have legislative in legislative capacity yes so to follow up to the question about a handshake agreement uh, when when staff looked at this uh, there was nothing there's nothing in writing anywhere so we this is the first we've heard of there being any sort of agreement as to what would go there at city-owned property and as as this went through the process staff just went to the City Council uh, for that feedback um, concerning adjacent property owners, you know, it's the we went through the standard process. Um, yeah, it would be great to to reach out to adjacent property owners. It's not the standard policy uh, as well, and so um, what we try to do is just go through the same process for everyone, so there's no charges of favoritism or inappropriate behavior. And before we turn this over to the planning commission for discussion, can can you address do the adjacent property owners currently have any land rights? Adjacent they, property yeah, owners? Have they, have they recorded any plats for residential? Have they? Uh, the So one of the adjacent property owners, it's currently zoned agriculture, has had some concept plans in for review, uh, has for a residential property farther to the north, uh, nothing adjacent to this property. And then the institutional use, the, uh, the medical center, uh, does have approvals for the medical center. But those are the only approvals in that, that location right now. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn this over to the Mr. Chairman. So, <coughs> yes. I, I think there was some confusion, at least when I was listening to the public comment, whether or not proper notice was given. Could we have the city comment on whether notice was given? Sure, this is now open to the Pl Planning Commission. Your time is yours. Uh, so, yes. Yes, so, so proper notice was given. The notice is sent to property owners that are within 300 feet of the property, uh, not necessarily businesses or the property address, but to the owner, the location where your tax notice goes. That is uh, to be, uh, better be the accurate address for the property owner. Otherwise, tax notices are going in the wrong location as well. So we sent those out and we verified today that they were sent. It's also public. Isn't it also put in the newspaper? Yes, it's also put in the newspaper on the city website and on the state noticing website. Okay. Anyone want to go first? Commissioner Steele does. Question. Thank you. <laughs> um, why is this uh, the title block and everything is town storage? We've, we've, that was because they were originally looking at that site. We've asked them to change that name. Oh, okay, that answered it. It's changed. It's now City Pump Station. City Pump Station. He does have some pretty funny site names sometimes that just don't match. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered. <laughs> um, and what setbacks are they required to adhere to? That's a good question. The setbacks in the code are for um, the main structure, you know? So it's 50 feet in the front, 12 on the side, 50 feet on the corner side, and 25 in the back. Um, and what we're proposing in the code amendments later on the agenda is that for utility sites in general that they don't have to adhere to those because as you can see the pump station or the, yeah, the, the Questar gas station right next to it fills up the whole site. So. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily, those setbacks don't necessarily make sense for utility structures, the standard setbacks in all of the zones. Uh, so right now, um, it's also a good question on whether or not this is an accessory structure. However, there's no primary structure, so it's not technically an accessory structure. However, it's not a primary structure either. Um, if we apply accessory structure setbacks, that would be a different view, um, view as well. I guess really, based on the code, without any changes, it's 50 feet, but the whole site is only 53 feet wide. 
that was my concern. I just thought that it, 50 feet was a little bit draconian in this instant. And uh, I, I think we do need to have a number, whether it's two, three, five feet. And uh, I would not see that there would be much difference between the side setbacks and the front and back setbacks. Um, it just it just doesn't make real good sense to, to apply that. And that was a concern of mine. Um, and have we applied those same setbacks to our city um, facilities? I would have to review that further. I don't know that we have. Okay, I, I would think that maybe we should, since this is city property and everything, we should if if we should follow what city the city has well, been doing the, in the past. The pump house that's there does not have a setback. I think that answers that question. Um, I I understand the concerns of the adjacent property owners. Um, I, you did mention, uh, uh, Mr. Evans mentioned that he planned to put some uh, commercial along that frontage, and um, I actually feel a little better about that, that there won't be houses there. We could, because of the way this is a legislative decision, we really couldn't do anything about it, but at least... You mean administrative, right? Uh, I, yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, it's an administrative... And so, therefore, we, we don't have, our hands are tied, but I think your idea of uh, commercial along that frontage is a good one, and we look forward to seeing it coming in. Thank you. I, I, I have one. Commissioner coming in. Uh, yeah, um, one of the public com comments that was read in, um, and I kind of had a question for AT&T over this was, <clears throat> do you guys currently have any cell towers near medical facilities, and is that a concern to have something located next to a, a medical facility? Uh, you know, in other states, there are plenty of cell sites on top of hospitals. Um, that, yeah. so there's a couple in Salt Lake that I've worked on. Where yeah. Uh, here in this state, um, our state loves to put them on top of schools, you know, on top of hospitals. So, you know, it's generally when, when you look at it from a, you know, a safety, as, as Mr. Evans stated, it's been prohibited by law. But, but just to give you a little background there, you know, usually if, if you look at the, the safety standard set by the FCC as a, as a ruler, you know, the carriers, and this goes for all carriers, not just AT&T, are usually at the one inch mark as far as, you know, getting up to the danger level. They stay really low um, on that spectrum of, of safety that is set by the FCC. Okay. My next question is for the city. Um, how come we're doing like a, a, a wrought iron style of fence instead of uh, the pump house is like shielded by more of a permanent, uh, I don't know, cinder block type of a fence? The, the pump house actually doesn't have a fence. The cinder block fence is around the Questar uh, substation. Uh, however, in other locations in the city, so <laughs> there's a good, there's um, some background to why we're doing that fence. Right now the code doesn't allow chain link fencing. We are proposing that it be allowed around utility sites. Uh, however, we're anticipating that that might not be well received and that we might propose some alternatives that if they're highly visible that they have a nicer fence like the wrought iron style aluminum or if it's a water tank that's up a hill and you don't really see it and it's not right next to a street that that have chain link. Um, our all of our recent utility sites since the code was amended to prohibit chain link have included the wrought iron style fencing. That's obviously an expense to the city and any other type of utilities, public utilities. And so that's one reason why we're suggesting that code amendment. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Thanks. First of all, I want to apologize for being a little late. But I will say part of the reason I was late, other than traffic, which I realize you guys have nothing to do with, <laughs> is because the other person with me had an AT&T phone and they didn't have service where we were at. <laughs> so whether I'm for or against what you're proposing, I realize that that is a concern of people um, from personal experience, not being an AT&T customer. I still recognize that as a problem and the need then for 
tower such as this. My only concern is with the city, um, and that is on the, the proposal, it says that, and this may have been addressed before I got here, so I apologize if it was, um, that the lot size is so smaller than what is allowed and therefore this would not be allowed at this point with what with what we have realizing that we can always change things things can be changed but we currently have to go by what what is written and so that would be my big concern which also goes along with um, the fact that the the lot width and the setbacks don't comply do you have any additional comment on that or did i miss well, Are there's there? code amendments later on tonight's agenda that would okay. address that, and it would be for all utility sites, not just this one. We This has been being discussed prior to them even applying just for our utility sites in general that we need a section related to those to exempt them from some of those requirements. Uh, so you're seeing that on tonight's agenda. However, we are still awaiting uh, legal review and city manager review of those, so we're asking that um, you consider tabling those. So you're wanting us to approve this before the law has been changed. Is that what I'm, at, I'm hearing? No. <laughs> so you could approve it with the condition that, uh, that, the, that it would have to comply with, code, uh, with the code prior to being constructed. Okay, thank you. Commissioner <coughs> Kilgar. Uh, so many of my questions have already been addressed and asked, um, so I only have a couple. Um, the future land use map for this area, uh, it's currently an agricultural zone, but it's, it's, uh, the future land use map shows it as, as residential, or I'm sorry, RC, resi regional commercial. Um, so as agriculture, agricultural, the height restriction is 100 feet, but as regional commercial, it's 40 feet. Um, so I guess I, I believe that's the case. So if that's right, it's right, it's forty or fifty. It's, it's yeah, less I, than I thought half. it was it's 40. half or less, right? So that would be a sixty feet, diff you know, sixty foot difference. Um, even if this one little plot is not rezoned, it just stays agriculture because of the utilities that are already there, and there's no need to change it to RC. Everything around it, um, where the if the future land map, land use map. Um, uh, is indicative of what it's going to become, then it's all re regional uh, RC, then there is going to be this huge 100-foot tower next to everything else that's supposed to only be 40 feet. So, I mean, it's, like, it's going to be like the Eiffel Tower for Saratoga Springs. You know, and, and, and that's, that's where I have an issue with where it is. I think all the, as everyone said, we need, we need this. I don't use AT&T because of the coverage. Um, you know, it's so, so I totally understand that, but I just wonder, is this really where we want it, where it's going to be surrounded by regional commercial, that's all restricted to 40, plus adjacent to it may be residential. And then um, it's also, you know, it, it's on the main thoroughfare on um, Crossroads, which is great because it looks like there's, there's a lot of commercial there. But at the same time, it's also the main street that we see. And is that where we want to have a silver tower? Um, that's not, um, that, that isn't the Eiffel Tower. So I, j I just, that, that's my issue. Um, just because with the land, future land use map, we were thinking of it as being um, that whole area being regional commercial, or much of that area. Um, I also I did have a question about vehicle access, but I guess um, with that easement, that will be the, the vehicle access, right? So that takes care of that. Um, and then the site survey notes, uh, notes project appears Oh, notes that the project appears to be in a flood zone. Um, are there any mitigations required since it says it's in a flood zone? Oh, that's not correct. Well, that, that's just wrong? Right. Okay. It's so not it's in not in a flood zone. zone. Okay. Um, uh, you said that uh, we, we got the colors and the materials, ma the, the color and materials board will be reviewed before, at what, what stage will that be reviewed? Uh, we are asking that they match the the pump house that's there, and so staff can review that. It can it can be reviewed before they get building permit. Okay. 
it's so it will be reviewed before the, they get the building. It will be. Yeah. Uh, that's my only. That's it. Commissioner Kilgore, before we go on, um, in the event that we were to forward a negative recommendation to City Council based upon your comments that you that you wouldn't want to support it, what code would you quote saying that it was not satisfied? Uh, there isn't a code. It's just the idea that the future land use map um, marks that entire area as a regional commercial, in which case 40 feet, and then we have this one 100-foot towers. So that would be, a, a, if you wanted to cite something based on what Commissioner Kilgore stated, it would be a general plan. Uh, you know, it would be, because there's always findings in here that it's consistent with the general plan, so you would be saying that it's inconsistent with the general plan. Brian, can I ask you a question? In the event that, he, that Commissioner Kilgore was to present a negative recommendation to the City Council, and he were to, was to base it upon the general plan, the future use for re residential commercial, how would he word that, and how would it, if, if that is the case? Clarify on that. I mean, I, I know what you're what you're trying to say. This got to be attached to something in the code, the requirement. And so, in the event that you were to to present a negative recommendation or a motion, we'd have to look that up. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't because everything else is fine. It's just that one. That's my only concern, I guess. And so, I might vote no on a positive recommendation. That's might be that way. It might go that way. Okay. Um, just a couple of questions. The first one um, is the applicant has mentioned they're willing to do whatever with fencing or whatnot. It seems to me that there's al already existing fencing on that lot. That consistency might be a good thing. There's something around the Questar thing that it might do what you know we can to match that rather than having different. aesthetics uh, purposes uh, the second question is just about the financial considerations to the city at which point will those be made uh, available to the public uh, that information once there's anything going in and out of the budget would just be in the annual budget so nothing specific line item to that arrangement so so there's no I'm way sure the there, there, I'm sure there, there would be a line item for that okay so just I absolutely mean, for transparency for transparency it, it would something. be available yes and then my major concern is just with the setbacks and and i'm slightly confused because we have this you know amendment we're looking at later um you know things like the lot lot width we don't even know how wide that lot is but there, there's a minimum requirement and setbacks and things and the consternation comes with the fact that i've um, seen conditions be put on things where it's, you know a foot within a foot of the setback in this committee or the council says no it has to meet code so it seems like there's a huge amount of leeway being given with setbacks with this specific case whereas in other instances it would just be an outright no this doesn't yes. comply okay so to address that yes absolutely that is that is usually the case in, in this particular case, the applicants approached the city months and months ago, and with the delays for trying to figure out what the council was going to want to do, even authorizing the application, what staff was trying to do was get their application to track with the code amendments. The applicant, you know, we've been very clear that if those amendments are not done, or if the planning commission tables it, or if the council isn't amenable to the final results, obviously it won't be getting through very quickly, but just to, kind of offset the, to allow them to reach a building period this year if the city approved it. Um, we were just trying to track them together, that's all. So there's always, as always, there's an option to table this until the amendments are done, continue it to a future meeting, uh, and, and work on it that way. So there, you're not obligated to take the original recommendation. Does the city know the width of that lot? You know the width of that lot? Yeah, it's, yeah, it it's on there. 53 feet? We know the width of the lot. It's just whether the setbacks are going to um so there is a 
does not comply no lot width is given and the requirement is 250 feet well we so we can measure the lot and we have an indication that it's clearly not 250 feet it's about 50 plus feet at the widest uh, if I can so it's 20 percent the requirement 57 so it's not compliant at all so it's Around 20 it's entirely root it's entirely reliant on the code amendments going through. Otherwise, it would be a lease of an existing non-conforming parcel because that parcel is grandfathered and exists. So what is the genesis of those code amendments? Is it specific to this case? It, it is not. It's something that's been coming. Uh, we've run into these issues with other utilities throughout the city where the city acquires property for a utility, for example, a pond or a pump house, and trying to acquire a smaller piece of property so that it's not as expensive for the taxpayers but still meet the setbacks has been very fairly difficult so that's been the genesis for for these changes it just happened that this was coming and these it kind of pushed for us to finish those changes sooner how uh besides this application when was the last time a utility application came into the city from someone outside the city it's been a while but the most recent have been for city city I items so the dredging the site plan amendment for the the pump station or pump house in the marina uh, there's a pond and pump house that are being done at 400 north um, those are the most those are the two most recent but then there have also been ponds up above jacobs ranch mount saratoga has a few uh, that you have seen and will be seeing so it's it's mostly been driven by the fact that the city is trying to acquire smaller pieces of property to you know to offset the costs and has had issues because of some of these very large setback requirements. In those pre-existing cases, were the, the, the code met? Were setbacks met? Once we started applying the code to all of them, yes, they've been met. Uh, there are a lot of non-conforming old ones, however, like this pump house that we're looking at right here. To the south, the pre-existing house. Hist historically, if a developer came in and asked to and wanted to do something that was a 20% reduction in the, the requirement. Uh, what has been the reception from the city with, it, with that sort of item? It really depends on whether or not there's a mechanism in the code for there to be a reduction. If there's a mechanism in the code for a reduction, you know, they're in a planned unit development or it's one of the setbacks where the council's allowed to grant an exception, then those have been considered. If it's a black and white this is the measurement then there has not been anything granted and right now it's a black and white this is the measurement there's no exception and that's why the code amendment is proposed for all utilities whether it's a city utility or a non-city but public utility you know they're providing a benefit to the entire city and so holding them to that difficult standard that makes it more expensive for them and charge their citizens and users more it's kind of trying to balance the the public good but to answer your question, no, there's been no exception given when a developer wants an exception unless it's already built into the code. And so this is not asking for an exception. It's asking for a code amendment to make that the black and white measurement for utilities. So an exception is, you know, easier to grant than a code amendment. True. Council. So even bypassing the exception, it's going straight to a code amendment. To, to there's, no code, there's no code exception available. It would require an amendment anyway to create an exception. Okay. So, so to clarify, although this is an administrative decision, it's based upon the code that is, as it exists today. And item six is a legislative decision which would change the code, allowing item number four, which we're currently hearing, to become. So in essence, item number four becomes a legislative decision because it is contingent, it's contingent on a leg legislative decision. So I so like I don't have a lot to add. I, mean, I, feel like, I feel like it's been very thorough. Um, I guess I'll just say this kind of has a little bit of a stink factor to it, the way that the way that it's kind of happening going down. I understand the reasoning why, um, but I can understand from the Evans perspective and, and the you know that this definitely has some stink factor to it that um, that I would hope that we could avoid in the future and Kim I know that you're not on the hook here because you're going to be gone but uh, <laughs> but you'll look back, back fondly on these days um, I am concerned about uh, the handshake agreement unfortunately I don't think there's anything that could be done because it was a handshake verbal 
he said, she said type agreement at this point, but uh, that does concern me greatly that our, if, if that indeed happened the way that you said, if our city can't be kept to its word, that, that, that concerns me. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to stop the public comment. We did close public comment at sure. this time, and you're not on the microphone, and it is a public meeting, so I can't allow that right now. Unless any commissioner just asks a question directly, then, then. Yeah. I, so I understand where you're coming from. I wish. Uh, you're, asking a you're, you're fine. You're fine. Um, these, these rules sometimes get a little cumbersome, and I apologize for that. But anyway, so I, I, I really don't have much to add. I, it does seem like this it's an administrative decision based upon a legislative decision, not later on this meeting, but next meeting or whatnot. Um, you can discuss it tonight, but there are some final changes, so it'll be on your next meeting. Yes. Okay. I, I don't know if the rest of the council feels the same. I would probably feel more comfortable based upon everything in, in play here that if we continued this till later till after those uh, code amendments have happened I, I would feel most comfortable with that scenario so my comment is I disagree with that because the code changes won't change the application so the application is based on whether the coach is based on the assumption that the code changes will go through so if the code changes go through then we come back to the same questions so I say that we take care of the, we deal with the application, and if we approve it, approve it contingent to the legislative uh, decision that we make on the code. Otherwise, nothing changes with the application, unless we say the code amendments um, are not approved. Then, yeah, that changes the, the uh, application. Yeah. So I recommend that we either approve or disapprove this uh, application but make it contingent on the code changes um, otherwise we're going to deal with the exact same issues next time I have a different perspective okay. for that um, given that it is an administrative decision for item number four we make decisions based upon what's in the current code and uh, I guess I do see that there is a leeway that we could ba base it on contingent I, I would feel more comfortable tabling it so we can actually see the code. The code hasn't even been reviewed by the city manager or the city attorney. I don't feel comfortable making a positive recommendation, but I, then again, I'm not the one who makes the motions, so. Can I also ask, ask a question? There was a comment made in the public comment about a time period, and if we table it, is there, there gonna be any problem with, with that? And that's just an open question for whoever knows the answer. No, if I mean if, if it needs to be tabled, we understand it needs to be tabled. Okay, and so that if will not run up against. Be approved now, but we understand uh, that won't run up against any legislative. Yeah. No, we have we have not submitted an official shot clock letter, uh, which is required that you do for that okay. to be effective. Okay, so, I just yeah. I don't want to run if we do table it. I don't want to run up against something like that. No, you will not. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. I have a question for Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans, do you have any specific documentation that substantiates uh, in the purchase agreement with the city of that land or anything that, that details um, the claim of you know, the handshake? or Is there anything in writing that you have? Is there anything in the purchase agreement that that Mr. Evans, could you, Mr. Evans, since you uh, were asked a question, could you come forward so you can be on the mic and on record? There's nothing in writing. Uh, the discussion entailed the fact that um, my deal with Questar, I limit it to a very small, specific area with uh, detailed requirements as to building aesthetics etc with the city there was such a small area left 
beyond what they needed, what, what you needed for the uh, water um, reduction facility. Um, when I dealt with, with planning and with city engineers, it was what could I do with this remaining little triangle that you don't need um, if I don't sell it to you? And <laughs> again, I was told nothing because the code isn't going to allow me to build anything there because there's not enough land for setbacks for anything. Now, if I were able to do what you're talking about doing and change all the rules, uh, I probably never would have sold it. In fact, right now, I can re I'm regretting that I ever did. Um, but that was, that was the situation. There was nothing that could be done with that. There's no way that I could have held that property and contacted or been contacted and said, how about if I put a cell tower in there and get some revenue? It would have, it would have run against the code then as it runs against the code now. That you're Understood. talking about changing so that it will fit your... Understood, order. but there's nothing in writing in that purchase agreement. Uh, no, regrettably, no. Okay, thank you. Nothing in writing except for the existing code and the code that existed at the time, and this is an administrative decision. So, all right. Any other questions or comments from the Planning Commission? If we do uh, decide to table or to continue, could we uh, make sure that we have closed the public hearing? I think we've gotten the public input that's needed on this, and so that we don't hear the same thing again. I have a check mark next to closing the public hearing before we turned it over to the Planning Commission, so that has been done. Thank you. Do we want to do a uh, quick maybe head count on yeah. continuation versus approval? Whatever. Okay, I school you. disapproval. <laughs> I'm a mug whooper. Mug whooper, yes. I have, I have I'm, a feeling I'm, we're going to find out. <laughs> I'm sitting Mr. on the chair. Yes. I apologize, but we're um, not supposed to poll the commission unless there's a motion. So I think Kevin would weigh in about straw polls and things like that. So I'll just be the attorney for the moment. I apologize <laughs> for that. So you could I just don't think you wanted to know what that was. <laughs> can, a mug whooper. Can, can you, you could have someone make a motion and then see how you, that goes. And if that fails, you, you can make another motion. Actions up on the screen. You could stay right there. I move that we, the Planning Commission, I move to continue the application to another meeting on the next meeting uh, with direction to the applicant staff on information or changes needing to render a decision as follows. Uh, the discussion and potential approval of the code amendments. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. A second. Any question on the motion? Yeah. Commissioner Funk. Um, I'm afraid that if we continue it to the next meeting, we won't have the legislative portion done yet. Do you want it done, or do you want it on the same agenda in a complete fashion with this item after? If it's after, then it would be done. <laughs> oh, it wouldn't. Friendly be. amendment? Wouldn't be until the council. City oh, Council still true. has legislative decision on the code of changes, so we, we would only be able to forward a positive recommendation. But, it would, but this wouldn't be approved at that point either. If they would just move along both Correct. in the same stage would, to the council. It would still be contingent. So why do we? Which was Commissioner Kilgore's Right, because if the point. if if. The, the code amendments aren't approved, then this will not go, then this approval will be vacated, what, vacated or whatever it's, you know what I mean? There's no, there's no bad thing that's going to happen to us if, I mean, that's why I say we go ahead and, and, and get it done rather than table it. Whether that's positive, whether so that's an approval. We do or have a motion on the table. Is that a, something that you would consider? Uh, as it sits right now, it does not meet city code. This is an administrative recommendation. The answer is no from the motion and from the second. It wouldn't matter. 
Okay, any other questions on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. 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 We have three nays, Commissioner Steele, Commissioner Funk, and Commissioner Kilgore. Three versus three, that becomes a? Wait, wait, you have seven, you vote. We have, you vote. And I did vote. I, I was affirmed. If there are three nays, then there should be four eyes unless it's, there it's was an It's four versus three. Motion passes. We need a roll call? We can. Nay. Aye. Nay. Aye. Nay. Aye. Aye. There we are. Motion passes to continue to the next meeting. So thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you for the public comment that has come. We will consider that. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, I need to stand up for a minute so I don't get too stiff. Right, I don't need take, a break. I just need to stand we're gonna up. We're going to take a five-minute break. We're going to take a five-minute break. <laughs> Should we turn off the video? Okay. I want to make sure I can get up and get out of here. Uh, if somebody will just hold the chair. No, the don't, chair. don't hold. Don't. Okay. Get, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 